when you consider you could have a planet like Mars that maybe down the line you could actually put humans on and they could live there as opposed to what you said about the moon. Like yeah. that's what makes that a little bit more, I don't know, sexy to go look at. Yeah. But now they're talking maybe, I hope I saw this right. I forget who it was, but one of the guys, not at NASA, but in the government talking about space exploration was talking about last week, like going back to the moon and how they're planning that and whatever. And when you talk to like all the people who don't believe they went, we went to the moon, I, I do, to be clear. But I think like, Kardashian doesn't, by the way. Oh, she does. She's, yeah, yeah. She's on that train I think, now. And that's what I read, that she's now a moon, a moon truther. I think they ah, call themselves. Yeah. She went all in. Good. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, the one thing, like when they'll bring it up that is quite interesting is the fact that we went in 69 with people. Yeah. And we haven't gone since. What What is the logic? Because I would think like the rock that orbits in our system right there, we would want to know everything about that, even yeah. if we're not going to like colonize it or something. Like there's there's resources we can definitely get out of exploring that and being there all the time. Obviously, we take pictures of it and scans and everything, so we know stuff. But like why, why haven't we gone back? Yeah, I think this is more politics and economics than science, right? Mm. So – um, there's lots we can learn about the moon scientifically, but you don't necessarily have to have humans there to learn that. And we we keep sending rovers and satellites there. We've we've been doing that ever since the Apollo era. So we've certainly been sending stuff there, just not human beings. Right. But why politically don't we do it? Um, I think the you know obviously the the space race is a, a big part of it. That's why we went. It wasn't. Yeah, the reason we probably put boots on the moon wasn't for a scientific experiment. You know, that's what Neil that's not what Neil Armstrong was actually there doing. So we did it, motherfucker. He yeah. was there he was there for prestige. Yep. Right. It was to show off that, hey, we, we can do this shit and you can't. Or yep. we can we can do it before you. It was it was flexing. And once we'd flexed and we'd done that a few times, what what was the point of staying there? I mean, it already we'd already established we're the top dog at that point. There was uh, the Soviets had given up on their moon program. They never put a man on the moon the entire time. By the time we'd put like thirteen, I think astronauts, I think walked on the moon. So there was um, there was nothing more to prove. And it costs an absolute bomb to do it, right? It's so expensive to fly to the moon with very, very little, well, there's no economic return really of, of flying to the moon. You yeah. bring back some moon rocks and you can throw those on eBay and try to make yeah. funny, but you're not, it's not really paying the bills. So there's, it's just, a, it is, you know, a, a desert, right? So it's very difficult. If we discovered, you know, here's, here's a, a counter universe and this multidimensional universe stuff. Hey guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. It's a huge, huge help. Thank you. I always love to think about this. Imagine if the moon was just a little bit bigger than it was. Mm. It's about 1.25% um, the mass of the earth, I believe. So 1% uh, the mass. Now, one it's because it's so low mass, it doesn't have enough gravity to hold onto an atmosphere. That's why it's a, a vacuum, basically, when you walk on the surface. But if it was, say, 10% the mass of the Earth, uh, it, which is about the mass of Mars, it would be big enough to hold onto an atmosphere. And so it is quite, and then it's in the habitable zone, right? Now it's a, a world which has an atmosphere, which is the right distance from the star to have life. And the Earth has water delivered likely from comets, we believe, that comets smash into the Earth and delivered all the water. Mm. The moon would have got that same delivery system, would have had that same Amazon Prime delivery of all that water lying on the surface. <laughs> and so everything would have been there for it to have had life. And so Neil Armstrong, you imagine this alternate history, Neil Armstrong sets foot and he doesn't need an astronaut suit. He's setting foot in shorts and a t-shirt and he's still on a beach. And imagine how different the next 60 years of history would have been oh, of course. had the moon had been a habitable world that we could just basically move into right away. Real, like real estate the size of Africa, this lab, uh, you know, the landmass about the size of Africa. So um, it would have totally transformed uh, society. So um, if that had happened, I'm sure we would have been going back to the moon constantly. But if it's just a dusty desert of moon dust with very little, you know, economic value for us, it just comes down to money. If there's any yeah. point doing it. It also feels like when you look over the last five, six decades, I'll just speak for this country more than anything, but you could probably say this in different places around the world. The interest for a while there waned in space. It wasn't the same. Like back then it was like, oh my God, we can go to space, which is, that's how it should be in my opinion. I fucking love space. Yeah. But, you know, if there's if there's one really positive thing about Elon getting so involved with this in, in his adult life is that 
as you've seen him become the celebrity over the last 10, 20 years, him talking about it all the time has people thinking about it a lot more, people interested in it again, which would make sense now with even something like the moon that lacks the resources for you to want to spend the money to even go there. But it's like if you have more interest and you have more economics from the private side pouring into this space, well, fuck it. You could go to the moon too. Yeah, It is fascinating though – when you consider you could have a planet like Mars that maybe down the line you could actually put humans on and they could live there as opposed to what you said about the moon. Like yeah. that's what makes that a little bit more, I don't know, sexy to go look at. Yeah. But the moon tunnels you were saying, like those caverns that they have, you said that was from, there was some sort of volcanic yeah, event? Yeah, when, when the moon first formed, it was just a big ball of lava. It slowly cooled down. There was still some active volcanism for a while. But yeah, the you know, there's when you look at the moon, you see there's these um, light patches and dark patches. Mm -hmm. Maybe throw yeah, a, a picture. Just a yeah, photo of the, of the moon. Uh, yeah, so all those dark patches are lava flows. They're called Maria. So those were um, ancient lava flows that happened, you know, like four billion years ago. And the la and then was you know, they covered up these cratered regions. There was probably when the moon first formed, like tons and tons of rocks just smashing into it, like every day. And that's why there's so many craters on the moon. Mm -hmm. The Earth, of course, would have had the same thing, but it's all weathered away by now. But the moon doesn't have that weathering process, so that's why it's covered in craters. But the dark patches are where lava came up from the surface and and smothered up over those craters, filled it in. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's a direct evidence that we have that the moon did once have lava flows. Um, and then, and then from, ran out. from sounding experiments and mapping from these satellites, we can see there's evidence for these lava tubes that are on the underneath the surface. So um, they're totally unexplored. Um, what, what they really look like, we don't really know, but um, they, I think it'd be super exciting to go there. I think what's really wild about the moon is that... Um, it's like you know, it's a bit like simulation theory kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but it is it is wild that we have the moon and Mars. It's almost like if you were playing a game in space race game or something, you would want to have an object that was close enough that you could do it with 1960s technology. But if the if the moon wasn't there, we probably would never have bothered developing as much rocketry as we had. The moon is only a three day ride with 1960s tech, right. and you can land and you can do it in 1960s tech. That's kind of crazy, um, but. Now to go to the next step, to go to Mars, is much, much harder. But still, it's a, it's there, it's a it's a rocky planet. Imagine if it was another Jupiter right, or another Venus. Ven we can't land on Venus. Venus will crush you immediately the moment you step onto the surface. Mars is like an ideal next stepping stone. If you would like to design a game to try and like nudge the player through a tutorial mode of like, you know, learn how to do this and then you can do the next thing and then you can go to the stars. You would put the moon yeah. here and you would put Mars there and you wouldn't make it too easy. You'd make it challenging enough that maybe like having the moon be truly habitable would just be too easy. <laughs> so you, you wouldn't really like push your, yourself hard enough. So yeah, I do kind of think it's wild because the moon is weird. It's uh, it's we have the biggest moon uh, in a relative size sense out of any planet in the solar system. It's uh, you know, it's 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 a quarter of the size of the Earth. Could we like send? I, I mean, you talk about these unexplored, basically like tunnels in a way. Is there a way for us to put a satellite up there that gets into the atmosphere of the Moon, and then, you know, you run some little drones down into those areas and take video? Yeah. Or am I thinking that far too simply? Yeah, I think um, maybe you can Google like Moon lava tube um, robot. And people have um, thought about putting like these snake snake robots that can. That's what um, I'm saying, like, let's do it. Let's go fund this, like, uh, crowdfund it or something. Yeah, I'm in. Maybe you can't find it, but yeah, I've seen I've seen these cool visualizations of of different robots that we could put down. It is it is a tricky. So obviously, you can't put a rover down there because um, it's a pretty steep descent to get into them. Uh, oh, yeah. China's doing it. Oh, now we got to yeah, be. Yeah, well, different different countries obviously have different ideas about exactly how to explore these caves, but um, someone's going to do it. Um, and yeah, maybe you know, there used to be the X Prize, the Google uh, was it Google X Prize or which was like you know we'll give you um, what was it like ten million dollars or something for the first person to land on the moon mm. and take a photo, and someone won that prize. Someone landed on the moon, took a photo. And beamed it back to the Earth, and they won this X Prize of maybe it was a hundred million dollars. It was a ton of money. Oh wow! Um, but so, yeah, maybe we could like get 
I don't know, Elon or someone else to say, he's got a ton of money lying around to say, look, I will give the first person to send photos from the inside of one of these lava tubes a billion billion dollars. Right. And that will spur like a huge bunch of these teams to try and get the investment to develop it. What is the cooperation like these days among countries, be it NASA and some of the other space programs of other countries? Because we're dealing with something that doesn't have a border. I'm just using yeah. the moon as an example right yeah. now. I forget Mars even. But like it's uncharted territory. Someone doesn't have to get permission from someone someone else to go there because no one has like legislative authority over it. So how do we even organize and what is the organization, I should say, of like trying to figure out some of these space missions these days between mm. countries? Yeah, it, it's... It's, I mean, there is a lot of collaboration, but I'm not sure it's going in the right direction at the moment. Mm. So you look at James Webb and it was launched by the Europeans, for instance. So the Americans built it, the Europeans launched it. Um, you look at, uh, and then a lot of that, uh, some of, you know, a lot of telescopes, there is some parts of it are built in Europe or Japan and they're shipped over and we put it all together. We assemble it maybe in the US and launch it. Um, and there's lots of, uh, you know, Japanese missions which share data with us. Um, there's again, lots of European collaboration. I think China and Russia, maybe there's less scientific, certainly way less scientific collaboration, um, because there's more obviously politically of a tense situation there with those right. nations. But historically that wasn't always true. I mean, the International Space Station has had plenty of cosmonauts on board as well as astronauts and they don't fight, they get on well. Like astronauts, That's good. Yeah, yeah, everyone gets No on. cops up there. Right. So there's no one punching each other as far as we know in the International Space Station uh, between these nations. So, uh, but I mean, astronauts are picked to be like, that's part of their training is to be yeah. like you're gonna you're not gonna pick someone who's an asshole who's gonna right. fly and be a jerk in the space right. station right you want someone who's pretty easy to get along with to be up there uh, um i mean so that's a big not part and matt damon in interstellar basically <laughs> yeah right he's yeah. he's a bit of a jerk in a yeah way. yeah you know what someone with like a really annoying habit to be <laughs> like up there i really like making this sound <laughs> You don't want that guy oh, with you for man. the whole time. So much but. can go wrong. What was the thing? And maybe this is like one of those things pop in my head. I can't remember if I read it or if it was a joke, but like China was trying to develop something on the dark side of the moon. Mm, Am well, I yeah. totally making that up? No, there's a bunch of, but well, yeah, I think China's interested. Um, so China has this uh, giant uh, radio telescope called FAST. Uh, we used to have one called Are uh, Arecibo, okay. um, but it got destroyed uh, during... Um, one of the recent storms, so it's, it's just in pieces now, unfortunately. It's in Puerto Rico, and uh, the NSF, National Science Foundation, supported it, but they didn't have enough money to basically fund it and rebuild it. So we lost it. It used to be the biggest in the world, and then China overtook us and built their own one. But radio telescopes are basically just giant dishes. You know, they can be huge, like hundreds of meters. I think the, the fast is, is uh, like 500 meters or something across, absolutely gigantic. And the reason why you can build them so big is because they don't have to be very smooth. So unlike mm -hmm. James Webb um, or an optical mirror, it's a, a piece of glass that's incredibly smooth. It's like has to be smoothed down to like nanometer scale. So it requires lots and lots of polishing, costs a bomb to make those things. And any slight piece of dust or anything is going to ruin it. But a radio telescope, um, it can basically be made out of concrete and that's smooth enough to like, you can just pour concrete out. And it turns out some of the craters on the moon are almost the right shape. Right, so they kind of look the right shape mm. as as a big dish, um, and so you probably, with a little bit of modification to those things, um, could use them as natural radio telescopes. Um, and if you put it on the far side of the moon, it'd be really advantageous because um, you know one of the problems that alien hunters have, one of the ways we try to look for aliens is to listen for their radio signals. But we are just are talking too much ourselves, right? There's all these like 4G, 5G towers going up everywhere. There's, um, you know, people have got microwaves that they open and send out signals. There's radio channels all over the place, TV channels. So there's just way too much noise to like really clearly hear. Um, so that's one of the big challenges of, of doing this work. But on the far side of the moon, there's nothing. Right? There, mm. it's, just, it's just dead quiet. So it would be like the perfect place to like really listen in and, and dial in to radio signals from alien civilizations and also for astrophysics as well. Can we pull that up, Joe? China, dark side of moon, just to see what, because it just gets so interesting, like you were saying politically when you're talking about like superpowers trying to do this. And now America's like, well, we want the dark side of the moon too. 
Right, well, there, so, there is no dark side of the moon, by the way. It's far, it's far side. Far, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm so <laughs> used sides. to Pink Floyd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah right, that's a so, common misconception. But, so yeah. China has successfully completed the Chang-6 mission, which returned the first ever samples from the far side of the moon to Earth in June 2024. The mission involved a robotic lander and rover that collected about two kilograms of rocks and soil from the South Pole Aitken Basin. And, de and delivered them to Inner Mongolia, China. The samples are now being analyzed by scientists to learn more about the moon's history and the differences between its near and far sides. Yeah, they, they grabbed some rocks off the far side and brought them over. Yeah, the reason the Apollo astronauts didn't go to the far side is because, you, for the same reason I just mentioned, you'd lose radio contact with the Earth. Yeah. So if something went wrong and they're out there, it's just those two guys by themselves, they're, they're, they're screwed. So um, we all the astronaut missions we've ever launched have always been on the near side, so it's easy to be in constant communication with them. And you said the moon's approximately 1% the mass of the Earth? It's about 1% the mass, but about twenty, uh, almost 25% the size. Right, so you're talking about it. <laughs> Big space right there. Yeah, it's huge. The landmass is, I think, about the size of Africa, roughly, is sort of the landmass mm. you've got to work with. So, you know, if you're a real estate developer, there's a lot of, lot of stuff to They got one of those in there. the White House right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see if he gets some, any ideas. All right, Joe, let's get back to our list. We're, we're like halfway through it. I like how this is going, just weaving in and out of this thing, coming back to 3i. The best side quests. That's, that's it. That's, I love side <laughs> quests. I'm from Jersey. It's what we do. All right, number six. Talking about 3i Atlas, this is a part of the 10 yeah. ideas Avi Loeb have that makes this different. He says, its gas plume contains only 4% water by mass, a primary constituent of familiar comets. Yeah, so it's producing water, but maybe not as much water as you'd expect for a comet. But the fact it produces water at all is exactly what comets do. So. Yeah. I mean, this. I mean, what Abby's been sort of suggesting in a big, more zoom out perspective from all of these points is that this is like a, you know, maybe a Trojan horse, right? So maybe this is it's like dressed up to look like a comet, but it's right. actually an alien vehicle They're that's invading. that's trying to trick us. And I, I think you can't really have it both ways, right? Either either it's an alien spaceship that's just clearly detectable, or it's or it's a it's pretending to be a comet. But this isn't either of those things. Right, because if it's dressing up to look like a comet, it's not doing a very good job. Because otherwise, it wouldn't have any anomalies. Yeah. Everything about it would look like a comet. So the fact any of these things are anomalies means it doesn't really match up with the Trojan horse hypothesis at all. Because surely aliens, if they're sending spaceships here, would be smart enough to not have ten things which all right. give it away as being obviously alien. So um, yeah, what what is what what's the game there? So I, I just don't understand like even the premise of like picking out these individual things. But I think this particular point is just like yeah, it's it's producing water, maybe not quite as much as a typical comet, but um, like that's exactly what comets do. They produce water. Thank you guys for watching the episode. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. They're both a huge, huge help. And if you would like to follow me on Instagram and X, those links are in my description below.